Um, so we were talking about um, the, um, the, the that I'd spotted that we owned all of these rights. And so, um, again, without seeking permission, um, I did a deal with um, an international sales agency to then um, sell them to TV programs all over the world. Um, and then we created our own uh, VHS distribution label and we used the island sales force to sell in and they just sold like gangbusters. Amazing. Um, and um, it got to the point where it was way too much for me because I was also running Blue Mountain Music at the time and I had U2. We mustn't ever forget that, that we had U2 and U2 had become very important to me and, and, and I was very close to them, you know, as a youngster. Mm. Um and so I brought in my best friend from, from CBS Records. He was my oldest friend from school from when we were 11 years old. Mm -hmm. But he was kind of pushing as a junior product manager at CBS. And I brought him in to run Island Visual Arts for me. Um, and he did the most phenomenal thing, which is that he was always interested in Japanese manga. Mm -hmm. And he um, started flying to Japan and meeting with all of the big producers and we effectively cornered the worldwide market outside Japan for all of the biggest manga um, uh, VHSs. We acquired Akira. We co-produced Ghost in the Shell. Sure. Um, and we, you know, he in particular, Andy takes the credit for this, not me. I take the credit for bringing him in. As mm, it were. And, and we created a phenomenal business, really, that, um, that, that again, was outside the island group. And mm. Chris was then able to sell it years later many tens of millions of dollars which went to him not, not to um, polygram you know mm -hmm. um so i think in effect that that was the moment where i proved to chris that not only did i have a talent for music mm -hmm. but that i had an entrepreneurial skill that also um was was, was in, could be important to him mm -hmm. and i remember at the time that i had these two great ideas for um for tv uh, uh, um, programs mm -hmm. and I, I I said I told them to Chris and he said yeah I really like them um, why don't I, why doesn't he why don't I set up a um, a lunch with Alan Yentob who was the creative director of the BBC mm -hmm. so Chris, myself and Alan Yentob had lunch and I pitched these two ideas to um, to Alan I wasn't a TV producer I wasn't in TV I was just this naive guy with some ideas so you were Alan a member. Uh, and, and, and Alan Yentob at that lunch said yes to both of them. Um, and one of them, which was a series called Rhythms of the World, ran for 11 years for the BBC. And it was important to our conference mm -hmm. because the, my idea was that it was an exploration of, of popular culture worldwide with absolutely no influence, for, with, with no, uh, never touching upon um, Anglo-Saxon um, culture, no Americans, no British Mm. We weren't really that interested in, we'd be interested in, you know, Romanian traditional folk culture that, that 4AD was. Um, yes, that yeah. was to, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But we wouldn't be interested in Rammstein. No. You see what I mean? I know. Exactly. Um, and we, we, we traveled the world for, or the program traveled the world for 11 years, whether it was with, uh, you know, Cuban music or, or whether it was African music. Um, and that and that became, you know, my interest in in, in African music, and, and my first African signing was the Bundu Boys, um, you know. Um, so so yeah, so I, I'd proven to Chris that I could, I had um, the ability to spot talent and to nurture it and to um, communicate with talent, you know. Um, but but also my entrepreneurship. Mm. And at, at the end of that lunch with Alan Yentob, there is a point to this. No, no, uh, no. <clears throat> It's all good. At the end of the at the end of the lunch with Alan Yentob, um, we were waiting for a taxi outside um, the restaurant, and Chris said to me, "I was, I think, twenty six years old, maybe then." He said, "I think that you can run the label." He said, "I think that you're going to be able to run the record label, which was the big job. You know, that was the big job." He said, "But you're you've got a problem," and I, and I said, "What's that?" And he said, "You're too gentle, you're too soft." He said, "We've got to toughen you up because." You know, I had all of the creative attributes, but I wasn't a tough guy, and I never have been a tough guy in the music industry. Mm. Um, and he and he said the way that I, he would like to do that, and this is really him nurturing me. You've got to really think of of that in the context of the fact that I was a twenty six year old youngster. Yeah. You know, um, was that he said, "I'm going to put you on the board of Island Records. You're, you're not you're not going to be a voting board mm. member, 
um, and you're and you're just to keep your mouth shut and just watch how it works because okay. Island Records is where all the problems lay. Mm. You know, lack of money. Do we pay the artist? Do we pay the studio costs? Do we pay the CD manufacturer? Mm. Do we pay the staff with some of the issues that we would deal with on a monthly basis? You know, and I sat watching how these decisions got made and how they got weighed up, mm. and I also watched how um, our chairman at the time, Tom Hayes would be the one who could incredibly juggle the books to, to make these things work. And I really learned an awful lot from, from Tom and from watching the board work. Mm. Um, and then I got promoted into running Island Music, which was the, the grouped music publishing company. Yeah. So I, I, effectively, I'd been outside the system reporting only to Chris with Blue Mountain and IBA. Mm. And then suddenly the group and I'm reporting to the chairman and there's a bit more uh, structure to it yes. but obviously um, Island Music with 100,000 copyrights was, was, a, was a much more important company yeah. um, that led to me then getting promoted to running it for the World X USA so I then had to I had the relationships with all the music sub-publishers and had to start thinking internationally which was important yeah. you know because Blue Mountain I didn't have to think of it because it already had an administration treaty with Island Music mm. and Island dealt with all of that shit yeah so yes i knew the sub publishers but i didn't ever have to negotiate with them so at island music suddenly i was doing much bigger deals and much more important deals you know with a bigger budget uh, and, a, and a significantly bigger budget you know a much bigger play thing effectively mm. Mm. um and then during that time i signed massive attack i signed shakespeare's sister we had you know number one singles we you know mm. uh, we had acquired the copyrights uh the the, the sub publishing worldwide to um Def Jam. So we had the Beastie Boys. Um, we we had um, Public Enemy, Reds and the Boys. We you know we had some really mm. hip stuff. Mm. And of mm. course, you leverage your hip stuff into getting Massive Attack to sign. Exactly, you know, exactly. You know I mean? exactly. Yeah, that, that was the game. That was how you did it, right? That's absolutely right. So it's always leverage, you yeah. know. Um, and so effectively, I was acquiring um, a cool reputation mm. with cool by association with really cool artists that I was working with that were always commercially left field, mm. but but were managing to find a way into the commercial world and into the zeitgeist. Yes. Um, and that was what Chris was effectively um, um, fostering me with. Um, you know, I had a deep understanding of the label and its history and its left field attributes. Mm. Uh, and I always honoured that and did all the way through my career even into Island Records, mm. you know? Mm. Um, so I was signing cool shit. Now, here's the problem, is that Island Records was signing crap. And this is a fact. Um, we had some really cool stuff going on. So U2's Joshua Tree had been just ginormous. Mm. Um, you know, I'd spent a lot of time with them. I'd been on the road with them. You know, I'd been, in, you know, on the bus, in the plane, you know, done all of that stuff with them. So I knew them very well. Mm. But other than... In my opinion, this is. Um, we had we had fantastic hits with um, Steve Winwood, Grace Jones, Robert Palmer. In fact, we had their three. The three of them had their biggest hits uh, as their last ever record. So, um, "Addicted to Love" for Robert Palmer, "Higher Love" for Steve Winwood, and "Slave to the Rhythm" for Grace Jones. And then they all fucked off and mm -hmm. left us because they could pick up a big paycheck from someone else. Yeah. And so Chris realized that he really only had you two left. And I was feeling that the stuff that was being signed to Island Records, whilst there were a few hits in amongst it, um, like the band called The Christians, um, Misha Paris, um, and um, um, uh, World Shut Your Mouth. Um, yes, well, so yes, uh, yes. Him. Yeah. Him. That, that wasn't our song, but it's that artist. I've, I've forgotten. Uh, Julian yeah. Cope. So, Julian Cope. Julian Cope, yeah. yeah. So we so we had those three on the UK roster, mm. but we also had a, a minor BG, which had no room on the roster, no part of the history of the company. <laughs> we had signed a singing elephant doing a um, doing a um, road safety campaign for children. Somebody else should have done that. It was yeah. a worthwhile campaign, but not Island Records. Yeah, um, we had signed Lenny Henry, the fantastic yeah. actor and comedian who's Right now, in not Game of Thrones, the other one, you know, uh, the, um, the Tolkien. Tolkien one. Yeah, Tolkien. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, as a serious soul singer, not to make comedy records, but to make soul records as a crooner. 
we had signed the um, Jamaican cricket team to do um, to do an album. Who who was working A and R at that point? Well, I, I, it wasn't so much who was working A and R as who was the managing director. And again, I'm not going to I'm not no, going to no. name name. No, but I was seeing this happen, and bearing in mind that Chris had said to me one day you can run this label. I was thinking, what label will there be left to run? We've lost Palmer. We've lost mm. um, Grace Jones. We've lost Steve Winwood. Mm. We've got you two, but then we've got this pile of crap. Mm. And mm. I went to one weekend and I said, Chris, you've been a bit removed from what's going on. With your <laughs> um, and you really need to listen to the roster. You need to, you need to listen to the roster, hear what's being signed. And you need to make a, a decision about about whether we're going in the right direction. So this was this was another of my Saturday uh, um, um, meetings with Chris. He asked me to stay the night, and I stayed till Sunday. I remember. And then on Monday, I got a phone call saying, "That's it, you're managing director of Island Records." <laughs> <laughs> so I had affected a coup without meaning to. That yeah. was not my intention. My intention was to, for him to take corrective measures. Yeah, but he the ultimate corrective measure and he made me managing director and I was 29 years old by that stage. Oh. Oh. So that's my journey into Island Records. Incredible. <clears throat> Absolutely incredible. Um, Mark, you must just let me know um, how much time you've got. Um, Martin's actually going to be joining me um, probably in the next 10 minutes or so. So I, I'm, we may just pause just so I can let him let him through the gate. Cause... Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm at your mercy. I'm, this is very long-winded, but you'll, okay. get, you'll get something... Definitely. I wanted to just touch on, um, you've touched on, obviously, your, your interest in not only, uh, well, world music, <clears throat> but your, your, your interest in African music. And obviously, you're coming to Cape Town, um, you know, which is, you know, on the continent, as it were. Um, and what was it about African music in particular that excited you at the time that you, uh, you did your first sign? Uh, well, the Bundu Boys was my first signing, but Ireland had already been investing. We'd, we'd signed King Sonny a Day, for instance, um, it, back in the day. Mm. Um, that was pre my time. So that so if you look at the dates, there, I can't remember the dates, but it was earlier than, than even when I joined Blue Mountain Music. Mm. But Chris convinced me that there was an African Bob Marley out there and that he just needed to be find, found. Um, and, it, and we need to mine, we need to dig a mine to find him. You know, it, you know, we've got to mine the, the area. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 Bundu Boys was mine, and and I was very f- fond of Biggie Tembo, the, the singer of, of Bundu Boys, who's sadly no longer with us. Mm. Um, and then when I got the job running Island Records, we had divisions. We had Mango, we had Antilles, we had Fourth and Broadway, and we had Island. Yes. Uh, and um, Mango, um, I, I also sorry, I signed when I was at Blue Mountain Music. I signed Salif Keita Soro. Uh, music publishing rights oh. because I thought that was utterly groundbreaking yeah. and I thought apart from the fact that the power and emotion in his voice even though I didn't understand the fucking lyrics yeah. Yeah. You know, I understood the emotion and what was going on I just thought it was the most beautiful record and I loved the fact that we had a French producer working with a, mm. uh, an, a, a, a Malian um, singer producing this very powerful groundbreaking music um, and that's where I felt the the future lay but but it kind of then leads me to the question that <clears throat> you know as somebody who was deep in air and off and and obviously all of it <clears throat> for an extended period of time you you didn't go to a school to learn any of this um yet you clearly had an ear for mul- multi-genre artists you were artists of multi of many j- different genres and you were somehow able to well, there was a trigger or something in you that went, this could work, this could work, this could work. Is there... No, that's not, that's not really true, actually, Jason, if you don't mind me backtracking a second. Hmm. The, the trigger was, was the, back to that Roaring Boys conversation with Chris. What would you listen to at home? Because Chris said to me, if you would listen to it, there has to be 50,000 other people that would listen to it in the world. You've just got to find them. Hmm. He said, trust and back your own taste. Mm. Don't look for other people's tastes. Don't do fashion, follow monkey, copy other people. F- follow your own taste. And so um, Sorrow and Salif Keita, I just thought that was an astonishing 
thought it was really beautiful. And, and I still listen to that record. Yeah. It's still on my uh, playlist of, fav- of favorite uh, of music. Yeah. You know, f- nearly 40 years later, it's still beautiful music. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I'm not going to lay claim to being in charge of the African music push. I'm, I am going to lay claim to those two signings. Mm. Um, but Chris was, was going to really work Africa effectively. And so Mango signed Angelique Kidjo, um, signed Baba Mal, mm. and there were many other investments. Um, and we started, uh, and in fact, it ended up being quite a source of tension between Chris and I, if you, if, and I, I, will, I don't mind touching upon that, because he started investing, you know, big Western budget uh, in, in artists, you know, getting Joe Zawinul to produce Baba Mal. You know, we're talking $600,000 album recording budget, then the videos and then the photo- photographs by, you know, I don't know, Anton Corbin or yes. you know, international world-class people. Yes. Suddenly a million dollars into Baba Mal. Um, and I'm beginning to think that um, the search for an African Bob Marley, um, we're, we're, we're actually, um, and you want to rifle shoot rather than shotgun blast, mm. but we're, 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 I began to feel that we were investing too much money, actually, and it became a source of tension between Chris and I. Mm. At mm. Point. Mm. But having said that, you... When, when, you, when you're working for someone like Chris, you, you've got two dynamics going. You've, you've got the fact that we need to pay the payroll mm. and we need to pay manufacturing and all of that shit going on. Mm. But you've also got the fact that you need to be pushing the boundaries forward. So the, some of these investments um, in, in, in African music um, were, were expensive and they were expensive gambles, mm. but they were pushing the boundaries forward. And I could satisfy myself on that tick box, mm. even if I somehow couldn't on the financial tick box. But you don't invest in them to, to make money. You hope that at some point mm. that they will, mm. but, but, you, but you, you can't invest in things like that with the expectation of making money. No. Um, so, so there were always two different tick boxes. Can it make money? Is it culturally pushing the boundaries forward? Yeah. Um, and so I would satisfy myself until I became, uh, you know, deeply um, in in, in um, running Island Records, mm. where where I had to rein the boat in a little bit, um, I, I j- just on the basis that it's pushing the boundaries forward, I could justify the signings and the mm. expenditure. Um, <clears throat> it's one of one of the last questions that I want to touch on is that obviously, when you when you step down, <clears throat> um, your motivation for for moving on and 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 forming Terra Firma and and moving out of that space that you had lived in for so long and done so well in, um, what was the motivation to do that? Because you know clearly, if you had stayed, you probably would have had you know as great an influence for a longer period of time. Well, that, that's a complicated one, Jason, and it is worth talking about. Um, I, I had such a stellar period of, of success, you know, where where you two were flying. My first record with you two was Acton Baby, which was a very difficult but brilliant record because it was a it was a change from kind of earnest to um, to to kind of humorous and um, and ironic. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, the first single from that was the Fly, which was the only sing- the only track they ever wrote with no chorus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, was, that was my first single. The track with no chorus. Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks, boys. Thanks very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then it did include um, one, and it did include mysterious ways. It had it had such beauty and power within yes. the record, um, and that really helped to set, cement my relationship with with uh, with with um, um, with you two. But in the meantime, I'd had huge success with um, the stereo MCs. Mm. Uh, we sold millions of records with the album Connected and had a huge, huge hit with the single Connected. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd, um, I'd signed Nine Inch Nails as my first signing. Literally, that was the first signature that I put on a, on a record deal at Island Records. Incredible. Um, and, um, and I absolutely loved Trent as a person and I loved and, and we got on really fine. And because he had such a terrible relationship with his American record company, for whom I was just a licensee. I had the World X USA, but I derived my rights not from Trent, 
but from TVT records. Yeah. But his relationship with TVT was so appalling that he defaulted to me for every creative decision. Mm. So, you know, you'll notice that it was Steve Osborne and it was English producers and English studios that recorded the first records. Yes. And I, it was me that paid for the videos. It was me that gave non-recoupable tour support because TVT wouldn't let me recoup, you know. So I supported Nine Inch Nails. They became what they became, very important mm. for us. Mm. Uh, next was PJ Harvey, um, followed by Tricky, followed by the Cranberries. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we just had this blessed period of signing difficult, unusual, left-field talent, and then actually being able to bring them significantly to the marketplace. Mm. But what happened was that, because I, but by this stage, Chris had sold Ireland to Polygram. Mm. I was part of the Polygram system. Mm. But I was the only managing director on a worldwide basis that still reported outside the system. I reported to Chris still. Mm. Mm. Um, and that was a level of protection that, that, that Chris, I think, had designed for me because he thought I was too gentle and too soft. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and also it gave him power. So it was a it was a symbiotic decision. Yeah. In, 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 very, very shrewd. Um, it, it was a shrewd decision. Um, at, but. Um, Polygram realized that, and I'm going to go back to the articulate public school boy thing, is that they realized that actually they had an articulate public school boy running, um, running a, a, a major record part of their, their thing that was having enormous success mm. that could become a poster boy when they needed to do PR exercises because they were, they, they were a publicly quoted company, Parliament of Phillips, you know, there were shareholders and things like that. So I started getting pushed out there into, into the public zeitgeist. So I was doing, you know, full page in Independent, full page in The Guardian. I even did a full page in Pravda in Russia and ended up on the front cover, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, but um, I don't think Chris liked it. I think that um, Chris began to think that I was getting too big for my boots. Mm. Um, and I was insensitive, which is not me. I'm very empathetic, mm. but I was insensitive enough to realize that I was actually raining on his parade or I was, mm. it was his parade. And there was a moment where, where, where he took me to one side where, where I, he was clearly upset. And he said to me, um, I don't think you realize, but this is my movie. You're starring in my movie, but it's my movie. And, and that, that really deeply upset me yeah. Jason, because, yeah. Every part of the movie, um, every inch of it was his. And I, that's how I treated it. Every signing, you know, when I signed Pulp, mm. I, I didn't do an exercise to say, how many records do we have to sell to recoup? Mm. I did an exercise to say, where did Pulp fit into the island zeitgeist? Mm. Tom Tom Club, Roxy Music, mm. you know, easily see where Pulp as an art rock band, Roxy Music. Mm. That's where Pulp fitted into the zeitgeist. Tricky goes right the way back to Bob Marley and everything else. Mm. You know, not because he's black, but because of what he said, what he was saying at yes. the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and and so Chris and I kind of began to fall out at that stage because because he um, he questioned my effectively my loyalty to to him, to him. and it, mm -hmm. and in doing so he undermined. Um, my absolute love of him and everything that he stood for because because I suddenly realized that I, I was losing potentially losing his um belief yeah and that that um and this this is there is a point to this that led me at the peak of my success to a profound depression a suicidal depression sure. and I don't mind admitting this and this can go in the podcast mm. I became suicidally depressed um, because I, it, it effectively pulled the rug emotionally from underneath me of everything that I was doing and all the reasons that I was doing it for. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there was no way that I could let anybody know what I was feeling. I couldn't let Chris know, and I certainly couldn't let Polygram and you know the mm -hmm. HR department know. So I had to effectively design my own recovery program. In the midst of this, because of the success, Chris was leaving at the time, by the way. So this this was round about the time that he left the company, and, mm. and that was it. Mm. Um, but at the same time, because of my success, I was asked to merge Island, MCA, um, um, Universal Records, and Motown into the company that it is now. So I was the architect of that, which is the the Island Group, um, mm. which is a, a very big 
big label. Yeah. Um, and um, and it um, uh, it was a, a, a an incredibly difficult time for me because I was effectively recovering from this huge emotional blow, and this was absolutely spoke to Chris's um, criticism of me for being too soft. If you if you yeah. think about it, yeah, yeah, it, it was an absolute manifestation. But it was so ironic that he delivered the blow that that exposed my soft underbelly. <clears throat> and and had it been left to unravel, he was he was almost responsible for unraveling all of the extraordinary investment that he had made in you for all of uh, the absolutely. years. But but then but then um, but then he was leaving. <laughs> so. So, so that, you know, yeah, there, 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 there is a cynical part of me that says, you know, what did he care? But I know he cared for me, and I know he did. Um, but, but, and I, and I, and I genuinely now, look, looking back with, you know, obviously rose tinted glasses, I, I look back and think that he genuinely felt that I was getting too big for my boots. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting one. I, I, I would, based on on how you've explained it, it's more a, a case of that that you were, you were. Doing not doing a better job than he was, but you, you were becoming the next Chris. Um, yes, he, because he was he was living in Jamaica, yes. uh, you know, spending time in in New York, but avoiding paying taxes there. So not yes. not even spending a huge amount of taxes there of uh, time there. Yes. He was he, he had um, he had nine hotels that he owned. That he was he was he's a very intellectually curious person, Chris. You know, mm. he he's. Like, kind of like me, you know, he, he wants to do different things. So he had a film company and, you know, we in our first proper year of trading, we won three Oscars with um, She's Got a Habit, Spike Lee, yeah. um, uh, trip, to, Ret- trip to Bountiful and uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman, you know. Yes. So Chris was doing shit um, and he'd done music for years. So he wasn't so focused on music because he was much more vested in the new intellectual curiosities of, the, of these different businesses that he was trying to master effectively um and um and so he was distracted and and i got the job running island records because he was distracted at that point too yeah Yeah. so did not focus were you were you able to reconcile at at any point even after he had gone Uh, only recently and and i'm hoping this weekend there's going to be an even bigger reconciliation so so um so I, i somebody from his camp reached out to me to say would i go to a ceremony to unveil we, we unveiled a blue plaque yeah, the, yes, yeah. i saw the pictures yeah. yes but 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 they didn't know when they planned it that chris was coming into the country today so we're going to do it again but privately over the weekend nice uh, i'm going to go and meet and spend time with him then which i'm really looking forward to it's but he's sad. in his eight now you know sure and i, 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 hope so. I know I, I and i have seen him uh, in the intervening years and it has been warm and it has been good mm, 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 because but it's been it's been in quite public settings, not not privately, and I, yeah. I I really need to spend some time privately with him. And I also really need to thank him for what he said about me in the book, where he said that after he left, the spirit of the company continued because I was such a massive fan of the label and knew so much about the history of it. Yeah, and and all to, to him, you that know, was a huge huge compliment to me. I, I was very touched because only about a dozen executives over the sixty year history of the company got mentioned. Yeah. No, and I, and I, as you said, I think your relationship was 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 entire. Well, not entirely, but it, he was. I don't want to call him a father figure, <clears throat> but, but... Oh, no, no, no. Let's get this straight. Hmm. My dad was a British Army Colonel, and he hated the fact that I went into the music industry. You know, he just didn't get it. He didn't understand why I would waste my life, as it were. And Chris was my father from twenty four years old. That's that's the reality of life. He became my father in my I, head. I do hope that uh, the weekend goes goes well for a whole bunch of reasons because I just think, yeah. you know. Um, but yes, last question um, is really around obviously where you found yourself in the last few years, and it's actually quite interesting to me that um, some of your most ambitious and creative projects involved obviously music, but then. You know, obviously, you would have worked with Anton Corbain with you two, and you would have, you were really involved with the the the, the visual side as much as the music and and all of the other parts. But I mean, Achtung Baby, by way of example, was was a complete package. It was it was 
you know, it was it was audio. It was it, it was from a, from a video perspective and graphic perspective. It was it was entirely groundbreaking. Oh, that's Martin. Sorry. So hold that question. Um, in uh, your uh, question is held. Go 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 and thank you. Let him in. I'm back in the room, sir. Good. Um, yes, yeah, so so I, I know where you're going to with this um, uh, because because obviously now visual arts is is what I do. I create augmented reality experiences. Yeah. Um, the, the simple reality is this: is that when I was running Island Visual Arts, well, let's go back to the mid '80s. One of the things that Chris and I dreamt up was that there were so many brilliant video makers out there. There were fantastic video makers making brilliant, groundbreaking videos why don't we sign them to a visual record label and have you two score their video, not the other way around? Yes. So do it the other way around. Have Massive yeah. Attack score an amazing video, you know. So, yeah. so it's, a, it's a complete reversal. We never got to it because um, I, I only ever made one signing on that front who, who's oh, really? quite a successful animator because I then got the job running Island Music and then Island Records and it just, it just drifted and went. Sure. And Andy... Andy running Mango had different priorities, and so it just drifted. But the fact is, is that for 10 years, we released 50 singles a year. So we released 500 singles. One a week. But each, of those, but each of those 500 singles, we had at least six to eight video treatments in. Jeez. So you've got to then, then realise that I had an overview of every single one. I read every single treatment, whether it was U2 or whether it was a new signing called Jarvis Cocker. Mm. I read every single video treatment and I really began to learn what it takes to make a visually appealing and impactful statement in three minutes. That's mm. really what you learn. Mm. Mm. And so I ca mm. I've carried that forward into my, uh, into my art life, mm. how to make something impactful and uh, to emotionally trigger people, but you've got three minutes to tell that story. Mm. And, and that's what I specialize in now in, in many respects. And it's, it's, it's obviously a, more of a passion project, I suppose, um, because I, I, I'm not, you know, I, your intention is, I would, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is less, again, probably no different to how you've ever worked, is that your intention is not commercial. Um, if no, it, it, if it, it, started, it started wholly um, emotional. Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, through marriage, um, my grandfather through marriage um, was a, a survivor of the First World War, terrible wounded, survived the, the, the duration of the war, wounded at the Battle of the Somme. And I wanted to tell his story. So I, I, I was, by this stage, I'm chairman of Crown Talent. Um, we are managing Jessie J, Ella Henderson and Becky Hill. These are the three, three girls that we manage amongst others. We had about 100 clients, but these were the three big uh, music clients. We had a six-week purple period where Jesse was at number one um, with Nicki Minaj and a a Ariana Grande, the three, the three of them together. Mm -hmm. Jesse was knocked off by Ella Henderson with her superb single Ghost, and Ella was knocked off by Becky Hill. So we had three number one singles in a row uh, over this period. And, of course, when that happens, brands come running. So you get fashion brands, you get makeup brands, because they all think that you, you've got a magic touch, you know? And in amongst it was an augmented reality company offering this burgeoning, unusual, groundbreaking technology. Um, and I made the leap in the meeting when they showed me a Heinz tomato ketchup bottle um, a, with the app applied to it. I thought, this is fucking awesome technology. So I decided that I would then find a fine artist to work with to create art. Um, and so I started working with this girl, Scarlett Raven. And um, we started working on World War One subject matter. 
Um, and I um, employed actors like Christopher Eccleston, um, Sean Bean, um, uh, Stephen Graham, incredible actors, Gemma Arterton, who are still really powerful a- a- actors, um, to perform some of the most powerful World War One poetry, where you've got um, Christopher Eccleston performing angry, performing Dolce at Decorum Est in a really emotional way. Uh, and then I was combining that with, I, I used a film composer, Mark Cannon, who I'd given his first break to, to get his first movie. Um, and so Mark Cannon scored them specially. So they had really impactful music, impactful animation from me, and then really powerful, um, impactful words performed by really powerful, impactful actors. So it was a really, really powerful package. Mm. Um, and I want them hanging on a white wall. This is the entrepreneur in me. So I raised a bit of money and we built a five ton film set of a destroyed art gallery um, uh, that we, was modular that we could move around the country. Um, and we ended up with 11 um, exhibitions, including national museums like the Martin Luther King Museum in Liverpool, um, uh, Manchester Central Library, Titanic Museum in Belfast. And then finally, before COVID killed it, um, the, the uh, National Army Museum in Chelsea. Incredible. And we we told really powerful stories with 10 paintings. Um, and the, the, the completely unforeseen and unanticipated part of it was the commercial success. Yeah. Um, I signed to a, a gallery company called Castle Fine Art that had 40, have 40 galleries in the country. Mm. Um, a company called Washington Green, who are fine art publishers, who are the biggest in the country. Mm-hmm. I didn't really know how powerful they were, but, mm. you know, but I, re- I now realised that I'd signed to Island Records and I'd signed to EMI Music, you know, there's the kind of thing, you know. Yes. Um, and um, we grossed over £5 million worth of sales, um, creating mm. this difficult, we had a, nascent technology that nobody knew this the, the week that we launched was the week that um that uh, pokemon go went live so that was the first time the public really heard about augmented reality yeah and that was literally the week that we launched at a, at a pop-up space in greenwich um the first month of the exhibition paintings w- went on sale at a retail price of seven thousand pounds and then the last one sold for thirty seven thousand five hundred pounds but then uh, then 1,100 prints sold. So 100 prints at £2,000 each and then 1,000 prints at about £250 each. They all sold. It was the most phenomenal, in one month, ph- phenomenal success. Um, not in a regulated space. It was a pop-up space lent to me by, by a, um, a property developer friend in London. Um, and that's what we pulled off. And that led to an invite to go to the Martin Luther King Museum in Liverpool that led to Manchester Central Library that led to, to, you know, and it became a rolling thing. But my partners at Crown, I had a day job. Mm. I was creating all the work. Um, but my partners in Crown began to not question my loyalty, but just push me to say, who do you want to be? Yeah. Um, I thought that after 43 years, really dedicated in service to other people, to helping Jarvis Cocker become who he wanted to become or, or Guy Garvey or, or Bono, you know, maybe I could apply some of that magic to myself. And that's really what happened. Wonderful. That, that is a, it's a, a beautiful answer. We've got less than a minute, sir. <clears throat> I don't want to take uh, any more of your time. What I have is, is golden. So thank you so, so much. I'm looking forward to shaking your hand. You, and you, you, you should interview me on stage you, you, because you know your shit. Um, and, um, and, and that's golden. 